I used to think macho was really fancy. What? <laughs> Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Hey there, Melissa here. I, like many other people, love me some food and cooking videos on YouTube. Some of my fav- Who is clipping their toenails? <laughs> some of my favorites are the ones where they take these common ingredients and transform them into something really fancy. To name a few, we got gourmet mix. I don't even- Can I say this one anymore? Gourmet makes, worth it, binging with Babish, Josh Wiseman's butt better. But I did notice something. It does seem like their go-to strategy for transforming something common into something fancy is to just replace all the cheap ingredients with really expensive ingredients. I mean, they make these videos for the people and I love watching them, but it just seems really out of touch with the normal person who thinks that like going to Whole Foods is fancy, like let alone a boutique grocery store. Who's got, who's got time? The answer is not many people. And it got me thinking, why don't we consider affordable foods fancy? Like, why do we have this association between food and class at all? In my humble opinion, if it tastes good in my tummy, then it's good. So in this video, we're gonna try to figure out where that notion came from and see if we can throw it in the trash where it belongs. I guess our first step here is reading. So I read a passage of this book, Distinction, by Pierre Bourdieu for a class when I was in university. And it's about the way that our tastes are formed. So I thought it'd be a good starting point for this research. And indeed it was. Okay. I did a little reading and I found something interesting about what influences our perceptions of fanciness or our taste for fanciness. First off, I should note that fanciness is more than just a big price tag on an ingredient. There's a lot of factors that influences our perceptions of fanciness. And unsurprisingly, one of those factors is social class. There's an NPR article that makes an example of something that I'm quite familiar with. Bing, bing, brown. And that is spices. Not too many spices because um, spicy food makes my stomach hurt and my mouth burn. And it's not the most pleasant feeling, but that's not what we're talking about today. You know how the Europeans did a whole lot of colonization? Basically, that gave them an infinite access to spices. Don't you think it's kind of funny? that despite all of that, British food is kind of bland? Here's why. So Indian food, like many other cuisines, builds flavor by layering a rich array of spices. In contrast, European cuisine focuses more on balancing the contrast of a small set of complementary flavors, or usually highlighting the core flavor of a main ingredient. But it wasn't always that way. The form of curry, no, not like the dish, it comes from the French verb for cooking, is a collection of 14th century English recipes made from nine manuscripts, the most famous credited to King Richard II's head chef. The recipes feature spices that were incredibly valuable for Europeans at the time. But then, colonization. As Europeans pillaged their colonies of resources, spices flowed into the continent with unprecedented supply. Suddenly, the middle classes could afford to season their food and spices no longer signified wealth. So, in the mid-1600s, the elite moved to what we now recognize as the modern minimalist form of European cuisine. So what that spicy story illustrates is a key idea in Bourdieu's book Distinction, and it's that how intimately social class and tastes influence each other, and specifically how social class gets to somewhat unfairly dictate the standards. You see, because we live in a capitalist society, Bourdieu believes that taste forms in direct relation to capital. Specifically, economic, what you have, cultural, what you know, and social, who you know. And it also means that those who are rich in these forms of capital are often seen to have more legitimate tastes. They get to build the ideal and define what is fancy, kind of like how upper-class Europeans got to take the spice out of their food. But I have such a hard time believing that what I think of as fancy is a simple out, well, a rich person said so. Like, you know, I get Michelin stars, and I get that sometimes, you know, I find things fancy because their price tag tells me so. But I used to think matcha was really fancy, and I don't ever remember high society telling me to think that. I have to believe that there's more to our perceptions of fanciness than we live in a society. So I'm gonna call Sabrina. Not only because y'all are complaining when she's not around, but also because we went to the same high school, we grew up in the same town, and have similar backgrounds, so it'll be interesting to see if there is any differences between what she thinks is fancy and what I think is fancy. Hi! <laughs> Yo! <laughs> Hi! So Sabrina, what do you think is fancy? Okay, yeah. The fanciest food I can think of is like 
really nice sushi. And the, mm. and the reason I think it's fancy is because like, I don't know where to get fish like that. <laughs> what do you think is fancy? Okay. Well, I used to think macho was really fancy. <laughs> Why? I don't mean to like just completely dunk on your your perception of fanciness. When I was younger, my family would always make these trips to it was called Pacific Mall. I would be like, "Ooh, going to get some bubble tea, going to probably get a pirated DVD." <laughs> It was actually like the inverse. Matcha and like Asian drinks in general just felt the opposite of fancy. It was a luxury in the sense that I couldn't do it super often. We had to go out of our way to get it, but it didn't feel fancy hoity toity, you know? Mm, I mean, we have a macarons because apparently <laughs> you don't think they're fancy. I I hate them. I hate them so much. I don't hate them because I don't like the way they taste. My mom is a chef. For me growing up, like whenever my mom is in a real baking mood, just open the fridge and there would be like 50. <laughs> and if we opened up the chest freezer, there would be like 50. <laughs> it made me detest them. I mean, I get I can't have too many of them. They are sweet, but that's a lot. And I still can't think of like a properly fancy food because for me, a fancy food is one that you can't make at home. And my parents are both like obsessed with cooking. The only thing that I genuinely can't figure out how to make at home is sushi because I can't get the ingredients. That's really interesting. Hmm. Thank you for chatting with me. Bye. <laughs> so I talked to Sabrina. I realized that I think I may have oversimplified Bordeaux's thesis about taste and capital and all of that. Because capital is more than just money. It's everything that you have access to. Sabrina doesn't find macarons fancy, but I did. Kind of like how Indians never built this idea of fanciness around spices, because it was always accessible. From that point of view, it seems like fanciness is actually about availability. Specifically, where something lands on the spectrum between easily available versus impossible to access. And when it comes down to food, there are two determining factors. One, rarity of ingredients, and two, difficulty of creation. So first, rare ingredients. These ingredients are either geographically inaccessible or difficult to mass produce. On one end of the spectrum, we have corn. In 2019, US farmers planted 91.7 million acres of corn, the equivalent of 69 million football fields. This vast supply means that you can get a pound of corn for less than $5. On the other hand, truffles cost at least $250 per pound, and that's because they need to be hand-picked and only grow in specific climates during small windows of time. Sure, there are times when ingredients can move across the spectrum. Like Sabrina said, when she was a kid, she would have to travel really far to go get boba. Now there's something like 150 boba shops in the Toronto area. On the other hand, we have the difficulty of creation. Anyone can slap together a decent peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But chefs can spend a lifetime building their craft, learning how to transform an ingredient, common or not, into something spectacular. It's simply a factor of time, the time you spend learning, honing, and executing. But it means that theoretically, with enough time, anyone can make something fancy. Okay, so with that in mind, let's see if you can transform some common ingredients and turn them into something fancy. Let's go make a shopping list. So in planning my list, I had a couple goals in mind. Spend less than $20, buy as many versatile ingredients, and three, try to buy as many vegetables as I could. Got my list, let's go shopping, shall we? I'm trying to make this dish vegetarian, and I realized that meat doesn't always need to be the star of a dish. And I also thought it would be more cost effective to stick to vegetables. But you'll probably notice in my shopping cart here that there aren't many fresh green vegetables. I mean, sure, I've got my frozen peas, but I sort of instinctively went for starchy vegetables because I thought that you could get more for less. There's many factors that influence the price of an ingredient, but I'm not gonna get into that here. But it did get me thinking about the affordability of fresh vegetables. And if you, like me, are curious about the affordability of eating vegetarian or just how to get the most bang for your buck at the grocery store, there's this video by Trace Dominguez that you should check out. Um, I just got home. Ow. Okay, so I've got my groceries here. I ended up spending 20 bucks on groceries. First, let me say, I still have no idea what I'm making, so I'll figure that out later. But I didn't get any leafy green vegetables, but I did get carrots. Um, oh, yay me. I got a head of garlic, an onion, some mushrooms, potatoes, ginger. I got a bag of frozen peas, um, lemons, 
a single lemon and some sardines and lentils. I don't know if I'm going to use everything. So yeah, so that's what I got. I assumed that I have the basics at home. So I've got like salt, pepper, obviously, oil. I guess I'm, I don't know what I'm making, but um, maybe with some creativity once I read a couple of books. Let's just go cook it. <laughs> again full disclosure that scene that you just saw i ended up shooting that in two days because i'm an idiot and decided that it would be you know super smart to start filming at 11 p.m but i mean looking back i think that i did a pretty good job of transforming those 3.99 frozen peas into something that i would eat at a restaurant and pay like $20 minimum for. I basically did just puree peas and carrots and essentially made baby food. I could have stopped my cooking process with just the cooked vegetables because they tasted really good, but I just wanted to be really extra and make it as fancy and extravagant as I could. So I thought pureeing it would be a good idea so I could just like paint on the plate. I think that that cooking experiment really summarizes what I learned throughout this video. Do all fancy dishes need equally fancy or expensive ingredients? No. Well, maybe. It really depends on what you mean when you say fancy. If you're allowing wealth to dominate your perceptions of fanciness and what you value in the world, Maybe you need to rethink that. If we go back to the book distinction, Bordia called it a form of symbolic violence. And basically what he means by that is that if we keep playing by the rules set by the wealthy and give them the permission to keep making the rules, we're actively participating and supporting a system that disadvantages those with less wealth. I'm not saying here that we need to throw out all of our perceptions of fanciness. But instead, what I'm suggesting is that maybe we think of fanciness as a synonym for special. You can attribute all the value that you give to fancy food in recognition of how hard it was to make, how much history shaped the dish, how hard it was to get those ingredients all the way down the supply chain. And sure, the price tag of an ingredient may fluctuate in size, but in this way, it isn't the basis of our perceptions. So we can have fancy food at home, fancy street food, fancy baby food, I guess. And I guess what I'm getting at here is that when we strip away all of these artificial ideas and perceptions of what fanciness is, I guess we come down and realize that anyone can cook. This whole video is me summarizing the plot of Ratatouille, my favorite musical. Hey there, I hope you liked that video, and if you did, please stick around because we are thanking Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Sponsors are what make these videos possible, so thank you Skillshare. If you don't know, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes covering just about any skill, from entrepreneurship, to graphic design, to cooking. And I think one big obstacle for people with cooking is confidence. It can be really stressful keeping track of things like ingredients, instructions, and making sure nothing burns. So I really recommend Kenny Man Rose, Think Like a Chef, a beginner's guide to cooking with confidence. But Skillshare is more than just cooking. They're always launching new classes that Sabrina, Taha, and I are using to keep our video skills sharp. And you can join us too for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. But this is the juicy part. The first thousand of y'all to join Skillshare's learning community using the link in the description will get a free trial to a premium membership. So whether you want to explore a new skill or deepen an existing passion or just get lost in creativity, get started with Skillshare.